thank you. I am delighted and scared by this uh, huge audience that I have in front of me. So, mm, uh, <clears throat> well, I thank, I thank first uh, uh, Johannes and Cruzes for this uh, invitation. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to thank Marilyn Sutton because the whole paper is actually an act of uh, thanking. Uh, the title of the paper was, uh, was written more or less as a paper, and as all papers, I had to cut it in half before uh, making it fit into a, a 50 something minute lecture. The title of the paper is Who's Afraid of the Ontological Wolf? Some Comments on an Occurrence Ontological Debate. And it has an epigraph, because I'm very fond of epigraph. The epigraph from, comes from Jean Genet the French uh, writer, and uh, I probably should read it in French because it's itself referential in that in the present case. It says, il faut écrire dans la langue de l'ennemi, meaning we must write in the language of the enemy. So <clears throat> I shouldn't have to read it anyway. Well, <clears throat> and the first part of the book is called Learning to Speak in Cambridge. Uh, Seventy years ago, I came, I came to Cambridge for the first time, invited by my old friend Stephen Hugh Jones to deliver a series of lectures when I was on an anthropology that marked a personal, if not ontological, turn in my career. Uh, those lectures, thanks undoubtedly to, the, to their distinguished setting and audience, had an impact that, however we assess its true significance, was utterly beyond my expectations. The wealth of reactions they provoked within and without our professional community ended up, ended up associating, not to say scaling down, my work to a few conceptual sound bites from which I felt unable to separate myself. Instead, I had spent the greater part of the intervening, the intervening years trying to draw all possible and, and a few impossible consequences of the research results condensed in these four lectures, in those four lectures. I do not regret such single-mindedness because it gave me, even more unexpectedly, a role as a political actor, a minor role to be sure, but a role as a political actor in the current cultural renaissance of Latin America, a continent with an Amerindian or Afro-Amerindian face and a, and a definite project to further a different project of the good life in this crucial moment of global metaphysical dejection. Be that as it may, the present occasion has a clear and clear <coughs> emotional meaning to me, because I would, have, I would never have imagined those distant, lecture, those distant lectures would turn out to be the ultimate cause of my being back here today to enjoy the privilege of paying homage to marriage to her. As a rule, in epidemic lectures, uh, the speaker is expected to start with some opposite reference to the work of the honored ancestor and then proceed as he or she pleases. I'm not going to do this. Marilyn Sutton is not, is not a distant figure, but a very much alive and much esteemed colleague, one who has taught me more than many anthropological ancestors. Her work has been a major influence on mine, not only ever since we met for the first time in 97, but as I came to realize, before I had even started to read her, when I arrived in Cambridge, I was already in the process of becoming a Swarthonian unawares. Call it the aesthetic trap of the intellectual gift, if you will. Uh, in short, were I a Haganah, I would be owing Marilyn many more fat pigs than I could ever hope to assemble. May the puny one I present to you and to her today serve at least as a token of my unpayable debt. <coughs> Moving briefly from Cambridge to Oxford, if you excuse me, uh, I have chosen a passage from Lewis Carroll as a perfectly fanciful rendering of a certain analysis of any piece of ethnographic material, or, to quote Hobart and Patterson, the sense of outlandishness that Stratton's sheer originality can produce. Uh, reading a text by her 
It's like opening a chapter of a book titled Marrying Adventures in Other Land. Uh, allow me then to cite this little passage from Through the Looking Glass, which describes what Mary, I mean Alice, experiences when she enters the new world. I quote from Lewis Carroll. This is the moment she crosses the mirror. Uh, I quote. Then she began looking about and noticed that what could be seen from the old room was quite common and uninteresting. But all the rest was as different as possible. They don't keep the room so tight as the other, Alice thought to herself. Let's call this passage learning to see in anthropology. Okay. This moment of, tra of traversing the mirror in whatever dire direction it had I hasten to add, is strongly evocative of the so-called ontological term to which my name among, among those of a few other delinquents has been associated. Uh, this passage, I think, is very Swetanian. idea of moving, crossing the mural, everything that you can see from the old book room is sort of common, but all the rest is totally different. And uh, it's not so tidy as we thought, which is a very interesting idea. Uh, <clears throat> so here we are. I have chosen to pay the homage to Madame Sotel by talking about the current ontological debate. Because in her work lies one of its main sources, if not the main, as far as I am concerned. Uh, and as foreign, uh, as foreign as the word ontology seems to be to her, to her own mode, mode of expression. Never mind the fact that the, the word ontology is not part of Marilyn's vocabulary. I deem her one of my, the main sources of the ontological term. That's, so I decided to pay homage to her by talking about this. Second uh, part of the talk is called On Ontological Delegation. Uh, in a well-known collection titled Thinking Through Things, thanks to which the expression ontological term acquired citizenship in anthropology, uh, the editors mention a quiet revolution, I quote, led by authors like Wagner, Latour, Gell, Stratton, and yours truly. Rarely has such a mild adjective as quiet helped provoke the very opposite of what it means. Because you, you all know the furor that this uh, uh, quiet uh, revolution produced. But what was it, that revolution about? The editors of the collection describe it as, I quote, a shifting of focus of question of knowledge and epistemology to question of ontology. End quote. This way of characterizing the move is referred to the final paragraphs of my Amazonian Perspectivism Lectures uh, of 98, who are now published by, by Howe. I later came to realize that others far more competent than I had already defined the modern philosophical revolution by precisely the opposite shift, i.e., from ontology, left to the hard sciences, to epistemology, which was uh, the philosopher's elated social scientist province. I was uh, so I was not, not too far off the mark then. Uh, in those paragraphs, I observed the profound philosophical debt, debt of our discipline to the Kantian epistemocritical turn and called for a return of sorts to a pre Kantian, pre modern even, speculative concern with ontological questions when it came to dealing with our ethnographic materials. I remind you that speculative realism was yet to be born in 98. That call to arms was presented both as a proactive, proactive, proactive sublation of the crisis of representation diagnosed, the crisis of representation diagnosed that problematized ethnography as a ultimately impossible task the writing culture uh, critic, and as a refusal to reduce anthropology to the ontologization of human epistemology in the psychocognitivist style. Uh, I didn't do so much, however, as did the postmodernist critic, uh, with the problem of the representational credentials of the epistemic subject, that is, its claim its purest claim to transparency, its monological elocution, etc. 
concentrating rather on the representational status of the object of ethnographic discourse, i.e. the conception of it as consisting in representations, cultures, worldviews, ideology, etc., which, which stood for, i.e. hid something else, like power differentials, relations of production, ecological constraints, or cognitive universes. I counter such current conceptions of anthropology as a reductive interpretation explanation of allegorical meanings with the proposal that we should move from the epistemological critique of ethnographic authority to the ontological determination of ethnographic alterity. Uh, the elucidation of the terms of what I call the ontological self-determination of the other in my usual bombastic style. Uh, I, that is, to a redefinition of anthropology as a comparative, meaning expansive, description of categorical meanings and not allegorical meanings. This story has been retold and untold, it has been retold and untold a number of times. Let me just said here that I trace the ontological term to three historical stimuli, not just one. The first was the already mentioned price of representation which destabilized the subject-object divide, just, at, just as it complicated the other two dualism, which, like the first one, are versions of the cultural nature distinction, the quintessential convention of Western ethno-anthropology. The first was, these other two dualism, the first was that, that between persons and things, also humans, not humans, uh, on one hand, and the other, the distinction between language meanings and extra-linguistic reality, concepts and objects, on the other hand. We know how the gender of the gift, the book, intensifying and, as it were, reflexifying the lesson of Moss, shattered the person versus thing presuppositional frame. By having Melanesian ontologies, such as manifested in that knowledge, knowledge practices, actively analyze rather than, than being passively, passively analyzed by, our, by our, our own ontological determinations, the gender of the gift offered us, offered us an entirely new take on some well-cherished tenets of our political economy, concerning production, gender, work, property power, not to mention society and the individual. A note here, the notion of knowledge practice so crucial Sotelian anthropology is a radically non epistemological concept, notwithstanding its name. I deem it the very icon of what Gilda Salmon, I will speak about him later, uh, called ontological delegation, the operation that dissolved the regrettable dualism between theory and practice, first by subsuming theoretical knowledge, knowledge under a generalized concept of practice, but at the same time, make knowledge the very model case of practice. For let us not forget the role that the, that the identification between social action and social analysis plays in the gender of the gift. This is not unrelated, I believe, to, such, to some other outrageous Strathurian subsumptive inversions, namely the determination of production as a mode of exchange, end of exchange as a shift of subjective perspectives rather than an objective economic transaction. I think all these things go together. As to the language reality gap, the second dualism, just let us just recall the visionary semiotics of Roy Wagner, in which what was, was before an ontological chasm became a process of reciprocal co-production, and more importantly, in which concrete particulars, the really existing reality, were reconceptualized as symbols that stand for themselves, a move which anticipates some crucial aspects of Bruno Latour's recent and inquiry on the modes of existence. By the same token, Wagner also set, also set a, precedent, a precedent for the concept of the material concept of Holbrook and his collaborators in thinking through things, through which Concepts as representations were preempted by concepts as things, endowed with material efficaciousness, and of things as concepts, 
world with thinking capabilities. This was the first stimulus. The second stimulus to the, for the ontological side was the rise of the STS, the Science Technology Service. The demographic description of science, with a capital S and the singular, both of the actual practice of the sciences, small s, plural, both as the actual practice of science and of the political usages of the concept in the singular, had profound consequences for anthropology as a whole. And that for a simple but, but far-reaching reason. The modern opposition between science and non-science is both a model of and a model for the wider divide separating Western modernity from the others, the barbarians, the primitives. Such is the founded gesture of our modern era. The identity of the modern West depends on this segmentary duplication of two outsides of itself. Because of this, any attempt to investigate empirically how science establishes its a priori political discontinuity uh, 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 with, with politics and with opinion, religion, ideology, etc. Any attempt to investigate empirically this, this movement immediately jeopardizes the other great divide, that between we and them, moderns and non-moderns, and sometimes even between humans and non-humans. This is how epistemology insidiously becomes ontology, precisely. <clears throat> Note that the anthropology of science did not abolish, on the ground of, of it being non-scientific, as it were, the distinction between science and non-science. Rather, it multiplied and differentiated such distinction in a cloud of practices with specific demands and obligations, as Stangers, Anne-Marie Latou, and many other shows. The epistemological break of Bachelardian fame became, if not mendable, at least bridgeable. Uh, transitions multiplied, continuities were observed, compromises noticed, symmetries proclaimed. This new state of things made all frontiers, internal as well as external, much more permeable. Authority became delocalized. The other, within or without the West, ceased to be the simple carrier of a mistaken culture that represented distortedly our external nature, or, conversely, a wild true representative of the internal nature of the human species, whose socio psychobiological evolutionary maker is always more easily accessible, as we know through the examination of the ways of ignorant people, <laughs> simple people. The ontological program had a reasonably clear idea of what changes it intended to bring in response to the above-mentioned stimuli, and has now a wealth of ethnographic as well as theoretical results to present as evidence, as evidence that, this two, that those two challenges have been met by anthropology. The third challenge, however, lies mainly ahead of us. It is utterly consequential, not to say ominous, from a political and a metaphysical point of view, and problematizes the very idea of an anthropological discipline, to paraphrase a philosopher, in a totally unprecedented way, unprecedented way. As whom I have presumed, I am talking of the feeling that there is now one big, global, major problem that confronts and concerns all of us nay, that conjures, that conjures, and at the same time utterly problematizes this entity I am calling all of us. I am referring, of course, to the ecological catastrophe and its dialectical connection to the economic crisis, the well-known problem of the end of the world versus the end of capitalism, which will come first at the first famous question. You know, all, all, you all know the phrase by James, I think, it's now it's easier to imagine the, the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So, problem is that they are actually very intimately connected. There is now a virtually a, a universal consensus among climatologists and other earth scientists that the industrial revolution and the exponentially growing demand of energy by all nations ever since 
have set in motion a process that, that will irreversibly change the planetary, the thermodynamical parameters that have been in place all along the Holocene. This made painfully real the negative transcendence of the world in regard to humanity, even as the latter ceased being a biological agent among others to become a major geophysical force. I'm quoting Chakrabarti here in a famous article that he published called The Climate of History. <coughs> Physics started to give way to metaphysics when culture and nature traded that traditional places of respectively figure and figure and ground. Now culture is the ground, and nature is the figure. Uh, the spread of this conviction reinforced the dissatisfaction that was already building up at the time I was writing my Cambridge lectures. Uh, around the turn of last century, which uh, in the dissatisfaction that was already building up with much of the modern constructivist metaphysics, starting with the Kantian ill-named Copernican revolution and its anthropocentric as well as ecotoxic implications, and helped launch the properly philosophical version of the ontological term, also called the speculative term or speculative realism of growing notoriety. Uh, I must leave the relation of the ontological term to the ecological concern to another occasion than this lecture. Uh, but I am convinced that in the war of the worlds to come, a war in which the end of the world as we know it, I love that expression, as we know it, it's more and more, being more and more used, uh, the end of life as we know it, the end of the world as we know it, the end of the West or modernity as we know it. It's almost a concept, this as we know it, should investigate it. What does it mean, this as we know it? Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. um, I am convinced that in the world of the worlds to come, a world in which the, the end of the world as we know it uh, uh, um, is a distinct possibility. And when, and when this time comes, it has already come, in my opinion, I am a pessimist. We will have a lot to learn uh, uh, from people whose world has already ended a long time ago. Think of the Amerindians, whose world ended five centuries ago. Uh, that population had dropped to something like 5% of the proper union uh, 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 one in 150 years. It dropped to 5% of its original uh, number. The Amerindians who, nonetheless, have managed to abide. They are still among us. And learn to live in a world which, no longer, which, which is no longer their world as they knew it. We soon will be all Amerindians in that sense. I remember, you will all remember, certainly the famous uh, uh, word by John Locke, who said, in the beginning, all the world was America. And in the end, probably as well. But in a different and inverted sense. Uh, so we will we'll soon, we'll soon be all Amerindians again. Let's see what they can teach us in matters apocalyptic then. Uh, Gilda Salmon, this colleague I was referring to, was a French philosopher, in an outstanding paper presented at a recent Cerisi Colloquium, situates what he calls the ontological program, rather than ontological term, the ontological program, within I quote, the history of comparativism in anthropology. This is not without significance, I think. But he situates the problem within the history of comparativism. Observing that it would be insufficient, though not wrong, to define the program as a simple case of substitution of ontology for culture, he explains the ontological program as an articulated response to a crisis of anthropological knowledge, which but started with the already mentioned postmodern critique. Salmon sees the crisis as related to what he calls the economy of the person within ethnographic discourse. He is referring here to the famous Bande East article on pronouns, the economy of the person in the sense of Bande East. And he said that here he connects the crisis of anthropological knowledge to the crisis of the economy of the person uh, in ethnographic discourse. And, uh, and frame the response to that crisis in terms of what he names the ontological delegation. 
Salmon uh, defines the, the notion of delegation in the following terms. He gives many examples among them from sociologists, God forbid, but uh, like Walter Ski. Uh, when analytic, he defined the, 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 the operation in the following terms. When an analytic cooperation becomes too costly, either politically or epistemologically, to be realized in a sovereign, monopolistic fashion by the sociologist or the anthropologist, he or she transfers it to the actors themselves, the analytical uh, 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 operation. This cause, these causes are total rebooting of the balance, as, it, as it says, a rebooting of the investigative endeavor, forcing the analyst to confront the unexpectedly powerful speculative forces that spring from the actors themselves, who are far more philosophically minded in a broad sense than we normally take them to be. The notion of an ontological delegation, because so far it was just the notion of delegation, the notion of an ontological delegation means that the anthropologist is forced to take his or her own ontological assumptions out of the strong box where they are always kept and risk their robustness and transportability by letting them be, be counter-analyzed by indigenous knowledge practices. Or, to put it differently, he or she defines whatever he or she is studying as a counter metaphysics with, with its own requisites and postulates. Anthropology becomes comparative metaphysics, even as metaphysics becomes comparative ethnography. And the anthropologist, uh, uh, and the anthropologist turn into an ontological negotiator or diplomat, a conceptual diplomat, if you will. To quote the position paper of the recent AAA symposium on the politics of the ontological term, which I co-sign with Martin Hoberg and Martin Patterson, I quote, the anthropology of, ont of ontology is anthropology as ontology, not the comparison of ontologies, but its comparison as ontology, end quote. Here I think it would be fitting to cite also Patrice Magnillier, another philosopher, who, after having remarked that the expression comparative metaphysics should be interpreted as tautological, uh, proceeded to the tantalizing suggestion that anthropology is bound to occupy in the present century the same role of model science and epistemic paradigm that physics played during the modern period. Anthropology would be thus in a position to furnish the new metaphysics of the Anthropocene, the epoch when humanity became a molecular multiplicity and a physically molar agent at the same time. And this is one of the reasons, I might say, that I have less mis misgivings than many of my colleagues about the appropriateness of this term, Anthropocene, to designate the new deep historical epoch we have entered. Because I think maybe we, have it, we are entering, as philosopher suggested, uh, an era in which anthropology may play a paradigmatic role comparable to the role that physics played from Galileo to Einstein, probably. Uh, as Manigli wrote with respect to Latour's ongoing project of uh, writing an anthropology of the moderns, that's how Latour defined his recent book, actually, it's an inventory of the different modes of existence modes of existence recognized as true a as, as true glass darkly though but recognized anyway that by the ontology of the moderns that's how many really described this pro this project of the anthropology of the moderns I, I quote the difference between latour and his predecessors many is thinking here of classic metaphysicians either early modern or late postmodern metaphysicians the difference between latour and his predecessors is not the content of his metaphysics, but in the very meaning of the exercise. The, this meaning is diplomatic. The point is to negotiate the meeting and the confusion of ontologies. Metaphysics is therefore wholly anthropological. If we are willing to define anthropology as that kind of knowledge, savoir in French, that kind of knowledge that explores 
the difference between our more deeply ingrained evidences in order to produce not a knowledge of something, a savoir de quelque chose, savoir sur quelque chose, not a knowledge of something, but a redescription of ourselves in the light of alterity. End quote. Or, as in the famous Wagnerian Wagnerian on one liner, every understanding of another culture is an experiment but one's own. Or, as Manuglier himself put in a, it in another occasion, more concisely, anthropology is the formal ontology of ourselves as variants. End quote. This should at least begin to calm all the qualms about the necessary presupposition of a meta-ontological level underlying the notion of ontological authority. Now, third part of the paper. It's called One of Several Wolves. This is the title, as you know, of the second chapter of A Thousand Plateaus uh, by the Lesson uh, The title comes from that, and you see that uh, the motive or positiveness of this title very soon. But my problem here now is that grammar of the concept of ontology, as we would say in the good old days of the linguistic term. What is the grammar of ontology? Well, Peter Scafish, not a colleague, it remarks on the, what he calls, incredulity and shock, end quote, which, with which many students and scholars have received the introduction of the term ontology in contemporary anthropological discourse, given its, its uh, term, I quote, metaphysical, essentialist, absolutist connotations, end quote. I, I believe he's citing Webb King here, I'm not sure. Uh, but the sentiment is certainly widespread, that this term ontology uh, why, why would they bring such a term with its metaphysical, essentialist, absolutist connotations? Let us start by recalling that ontology is not the only philosophically charged word used by anthropology. Not to speak of the very name of the discipline, a compound of two metaphysical, essentialist, etc. concepts. Uh, not, only, not to mention that the very name of the discipline, we have been happily playing along with words like politics or myth, a philosophical concept, if, if ever there was one. Myth was invented by philosophers to describe the, what was not philosophy. So that's a purely philosophical concept. Uh, we have been playing along with this concept like politics or myth without much ado. When it comes to ontology, we come along. Anthropology did not wait for ontology to enter the stage to have its own metaphysics. Uh, a tacit, and I quote Scafish again, the tacit metaphysical, metaphysics of anthropology, that poorly mixed, difficult to swallow cocktail of the phenomenological Heidegger, Merleau Ponty, Foucault, a little Marx, according to which everything human is constituted in essence from the same mix of Zusammenheit, lived experience, perceptual cognitive forms, historical conditions, and that favorite, favorite metaphysical master concept of anthropology, practice. Unless that metaphysics is spoken out and exposed of what it is, a metaphysics, the new explicitly metaphysical metaphysics of anthropology will not be heard. End quote. Be that as it may, the proud word ontology, as Kant once said, Kant once referred to ontology as the proud word ontology, and he suggested to substitute it uh, 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 by a much humbler word, the pure analytic of the understanding. Uh, the proud word ontology was not a, re a newfangled recirculation of an archive or named concept. Suffice it to recall the wonderful paper by Irvin Hallowell called, titled, Ojibwa Ontology, Behavior and Worldview, published 54 years ago. Neither was it the exclusive brainchild of a certain Cambridge clique as an anonymous objector dubbed the ontological town folks. The Cambridge cliques referred basically to the, contrib to, to the contributors to think it through things, and myself, I guess. 
uh, with the evil hand of Marilyn Sotel somehow behind all that. I am the fit. This is what the Cambridge Lick was all about. I would say that was the term was not just to the brainchild of the Cambridge Lick, uh, because the term ontology appeared more or less at the same time in many an STS context. Think of Anne Marie Mall, or John Law, or Bruno Latour, or Andrew Pickering, for that matter. It appeared in the prose of philosophers, historians of science, like Jeffrey Lloyd, Ian Hacking, Peter Gallison. Even, even as it was independently adopted, relatively so independently, I mean, by many anthropologists, think of Philippe de Scola, Michael Scott, Gaston Hage, Elizabeth Polinelli, or Naoki Kasuga. Recall also that the whole psychocognitive sect of our discipline seems perfectly happy with the term. Use it, it goes without saying, in their own metaphysical, essentialist, and absolute, absolutist way. As a matter of course, ontology can be found a bit everywhere these days, term. from political science journals to computer programming lingo. Uh, the meaning of the term in, the, in these different contexts and authors varies exceedingly, for sure. But beyond such diversity, the current popularity of the term bears witness to some sea changes that affect the whole zeitgeist, in my opinion. Namely, the exhaustion of the critical nomos, the critical uh, ontological economy, that separated the phenomenon from the thing in itself, and the breaking apart, as well, of the hierarchical division of work, the hierarchical division of work between natural and cultural sciences, as well as between pure or theoretical, theoretical reason and practical or moral reason. But it helps, above all, it expresses the growing feeling, uh, but in the recirculation of this term, it expresses the growing feeling that our own modern ontology, singular, such as laid down by the scientific revolution of the 17th century, uh, not only was made largely obsolete by the scientific revolutions of the early 20th century, but it, uh, that it also turned out to have disastrous consequences when it went considered from its business end, literally, i.e., as an imperialist, colonialist, ethnocidal, and ecocidal mode of production. Ontology came to the fore precisely at the moment that the, that the ontological foundations of our civilization and the unquestioned for cultural supremacy of the peoples who founded it are seen as starting to crumble down. This led, among other things, to a growing tendency, not to talk its fierce enemies, because without saying, but this led, among other things, to a growing tendency to accept the plural inflection of the word ontologies, in the plural, and the, of the word and the thing, either internally, by affirming, by professing a pluralistic ontology, or externally, by professing what we could call an ontological pluralism, which is not exactly the same thing. Ontological pluralism is not necessarily the same thing as a, a, a pluralistic ontology. And, I don't mean, sorry, this led to a growing tendency to accept the plural inflection of the word and the thing, and even, uh, and even to the post plural awareness, the term of post plural is a Stratonic, as you know, the post plural awareness of what I would call a performative condition of ontological anarchy, to borrow a concept from Peter Lambert Wilson, uh, Akimbe, also known as Akimbe. Uh, as we shall see, not all political anarchists accept ontological anarchy, i.e., the idea that the only viable political meaning of ontology in our times depends on accepting authority and occupation as unsubsumable, unsubsumable by any transcendent point of view. <coughs> the very idea of a transcendent point of view is an oxymoron, which did not prevent it from being posited by some ontologists. The affirmation of authority, of being as other, as intrinsic to being as being, as Latour said, and of equivocation, or as Manigier put it, of variation as truth, 
is not tantamount mm, to the positive of one ontology. I repeat, the affirmation of alterity is not tantamount to the positive of one ontology, even if a pluralist one, neither of many ontology for that matter, but signifies rather that ontological questions are political questions insofar as they come into existence only in the context of friction and divergence, divergence between concepts, practices and experiences within or without culturally individuated collectives. Given, I stress the polycentric world, world, polycentric value of this word given, given the absolute absence of any exterior or superior arbiter to these frictions and divergences. Ontological differences, to get to the point, are political because they imply a situation of war. Not a war of words, but a war of worlds. No arbiter, no god, no UN force intervention, no police operation to bring delinquents into line. The war will be as often as not fought with guerrilla tactics, of course, until, until the powers, until the powers that be, i.e., I mean Monsanto, BP, or Nestle, bring their atomics to the scene, of course. Uh, but is this a satisfactory answer to the question of one or several worlds? that I put at the beginning, i.e. ontologies, one or several ontologies. I am not sure. We are trying. Uh, it depends on how you use the word, of course. There is nothing wrong in principle in talking of as many ontologies as there are cultures. I know Martin Hobart disagrees, and I agree with him partially. Uh, just as you can say of any physical theory that it has its own ontology. This is perfectly common in physical in physics lingo, in which Theory has its own ontology. There's nothing wrong in principle in saying that to have as many ontologies as there are cultures. But not because ontology is just another name for culture, as in the famous Manchester debate. But rather because culture may always have been just another name for ontology. Minus nature, of course. A poor name ontology, if you will. That's what culture was. Uh, the only authentically ontological notion of culture I am aware of is that of Wagner in the invention of culture, precisely because it comprises a variation of natures in parallel to that of cultures. I have, I have always found a tad bizarre the Manchester question, because ontology, as I understand it, is both an anti-epistemological and countercultural, in both sense of the word counterculture, and countercultural philosophical war machine. If ontology were to be just another name for anything, I would suggest that it would have been nature, not culture. Nature, a term, the grammatical pluralization of which provoked the same uneasiness as that of ontology. For the same reason. How can you speak of many natures? Hence my Amazonian mode naturalism, a sort of ethnographically grounded proof of concept, of the argument according to which if anthropologists were more than willing to accept a bloated universe when it came to cultures, I'm evoking here a quining argument that appeared in the page of Cambrian Anthropology by Haywood, must be here. Uh, if anthropologists are more than willing to accept a bloated universe when it came to cultures, then in the name of what exactly would one forbid them to go for bloated, that is called multiple, natural universe as well? Why should we have to go to an anorexic universe then, when it comes to nature if we're willing to set an obese cultural universe uh, or a multiverse to recall the celebrated concept of William James? As someone observed in that already mentioned paper, in many works that further the ontological program, the metaphysics of representation is shown to be more efficaciously shattered by means of the ethnographic description of a counter metaphysics than by internal demystification to which the postmodern criticism was adapted. In the particular case of the Amazon of the Amazonian perspectivism, which, lest I forget to remind you of this, was consubstantial to a certain economy of the person in some sense. Uh, Consubstantial to a certain economy of the person where the position of the self was metaphysically encompassed by that of the other, 
the potential of fine, the enemy. Uh, in the, that particular case, the problem of photographic authority was completely overtaken, or perhaps sublated, i.e. forgotten by incorporation, by the anthropology or indigenous metaphysics of alterity. But the question somehow remains. Can we do with ontology what we did with culture, namely, having one ontology singular with a small, with a capital O, and many little ontologies plural with a lowercase o, just like we have with culture? Should we do this? Can we do this? What is a, by the way, what is a grammatical number of ontology? Is it a count now to begin with? Or is all some sort of mass now? Uh, does it accept an indefinite plural, or must it be inflected only in a dual form? For instance, as in an anthropomorphic versus anthropocentric ontologies, as I sometimes imagine, there are only two. Uh, does it accept a power cow, a greater power cow, a trial, perhaps a quadral number of inflection? I suggest you consult the Wikipedia, because I discovered this nice little term in the Wikipedia. This is a type of plural in different languages. Languages have plural for four, four, four things, or three things, or two things, and then for many things, different uh, suffixes. Uh, should the, what, what kind of number has ontology? As in this scholar, in this scholar case, for instance, ontology is a quadro, a quadro uh, term. It accepts only four uh, uh, instances. There are, there are only uh, four ontologies. And there must be only four ontologies. So it's a quadro uh, beast, not a tuple beast or trio beast, or indefinitely many beasts. It is a quadro beast. Um, <laughs> Not to mention, of course, uh, 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 the already mentioned post-plural, comparative, fractally, fractally multiple, scale-independent, moving target-like ontology deployed by Strathurian anthropology, with which I am aligned, and which is a sort of a metaphysical methodological parties by the Doctor Who, uh, people who follow Doctor Who, and everyone he is familiar with, this absolutely English uh, object. But uh, which is a sort of ontological TARDIS, uh, partial connections, is a little book that is much bigger inside, just like the TARDIS. And, uh, or, again, is it ontology better employed as an adjective rather than a substantive only? We can talk about ontological questions, but not about ontologies. These are all open questions for you. Yet again, do ontology behave like rigid, impenetrable solids that are solipsistically withdrawn within their own intransferability? As or as Jensen and Morita, our two colleagues uh, who write about Japanese anthropology, suggest, uh, do they show, I mean ontologists, uh, do they show a, a wealth of, I see, I quote, complex interplays through which different, different ontologies are often busily interfering, interfering with each other. Ontologies are never hermetically sealed, but are always part of multiple engagements." End quote. I find it impossible to disagree with this statement, of course, but I would just add that sometimes it may be pragmatically, i.e. politically, vital to describe ontologies as intractable sets of presuppositions that are aggressively contradictory with one another, uh, and or as crossing one another in the free space of chaos without any mutual inter interference whatsoever. There's no reason not to have context in which you must, let's say, rigidify or solidify ontologies. Let's call it a strategic Exoticism, if you do. strategic ontologies. As Holbrook has remarked in the same vein, in ontological term, the word term ends up being more important than ontological. For, for a term has many more senses than that of a change of direction, a shift towards a better, brighter paradigm, an anthropological city upon a hill. Uh, it may mean the act, and I'm quoting from my Mac my, my dictionary here, the word turn may mean the act of moving something in a circular direction around an axis or point, <laughs> as in the turn of the screw. 
And in an important sense, what I have, we have been advocating was essentially an ontological turn of the epistemological screw. <laughs> a methodological tightening up of our ethnographic descriptions, precisely. Uh, which, rather than allowing us to discover new things about the other, on the contrary, mark the limits of what can be known and then said about that other. It also meant term, as in, I quote the dictionary again, an opportunity or obligation to do something that comes successively to each of a number of people. And in this sense, the ontological term is the term of the native. The act of making room for the other. Faire la place aux autres, as Engels put it. The obligation of letting the natives, whoever they are, have it, ontologically wise, their own way. Lastly, the notion of a term means, and here I paraphrase over the game, the act of deformation, translation, variation of certain conceptual certainties of the analyst, so as to make sense, I mean make real, which does not mean make actual, so as to make real the certainties of what that matters, the complexities of your mind. As Patrice Malini again also wrote, it is the fact of variation that makes us think, never the naked fa fact, the fabu, the naked truth, we might say. It is a fact of variation that makes us think, never the naked fact of whatever is the case. Fourth and I think final session. section. Marius Lutern once defined as anthropologist's problem that of, I quote, how to create an awareness of different social worlds when all at one disposal is terms which belong to one's own, end quote. I read this as equivalent to my problem of how to create the conditions of ontological self-determination of the other when all, all we have at our disposal are our own ontological presuppositions. I draw from this constituting paradox a fundamental principle of what would be called the discipline epistemological ethics. I quote myself, always leave a way out for the people you are describing. End quote. My inspiration here came from difference repeti and repetition, where Deleuze describes the concept of the other, autrui, which is not autre, it's autrui, it's a, a different, different, difficult to translate in English, I don't know how to translate it. But he described the concept of the concept of autrui, other. I repeat here what I wrote in the relative native uh, recently uh, published in how as well. What the lay's name is autrui is less than, is, is, is less a concrete, already actualized other as against a self, than the structure that makes exist both a self and another. This structure is that of possibility. Autrui is the possibility the threat of the promise of another world contained in the face of the other, i.e. in its perspective. In the, course of social, in the course of social interaction with a concrete other, that world must always be actualized by a self. The implication of the possible, which is the other, is explicated by me. This means that the possible goes through a process of verification that entropically dissipates its structure. When I develop the world expressed by another, it is, so as, it, is so, it is so as to validate it as real and enter into it. I say what the other is expressing is a real world. I am part of it. Or to falsify it as unreal, and then, if I'm an anthropologist, to explain why this is the case. Deleuze indicated the limiting conditions that allowed him to determine the concept of the other in the following terms. Concentrate on, freeze frame your description at the moment in, in, in which the expressor still has no existence for us beyond that which expresses it the other as the expression of a possible world, period. <clears throat> Anthropology can make good use, I think, of this advice. 
maintaining <coughs> another's values implicit does not mean celebrating some nominal mystery that they might hide, uh, but rather amounts to refusing to actualize the possibilities expressed by indigenous thought, choosing to sustain, sustain them as possible indefinitely, i.e. neither dismissing them as the fantasies of others, nor by fantasizing ourselves that they may gain their reality for us. The delivered moment in which the world of the order does not exist beyond its expression transforms itself, in the case of anthropology, into an abiding condition that is a condition internal to the anthropological relation, which renders the, the, possi the possible virtual. Anthropology's role, then, is not that of explaining the world of the other, but rather of multiplying our world. I quote, filling it with all those things expressed that do not exist beyond that expression, end quote. In other words, do not explain too much. Do not try to actualize the possibilities imminent to others stored, but endeavor to sustain them as possible indefinitely. This is what permanent means in another, in another of my bombastic proclamations, namely the definition of anthropology as the permanent decolonization of thought. That means that we should neither dismiss those possibilities, no, sorry, I'm repeating here. Yes, should neither dismiss those possibilities, the fantasies of others, nor fantasize that they may gain the same reality for ourselves. They will not. Not as such, at least, only as other. The self-determination of the other is the other determination of the self. Let me, turn, let me return here to the one or many worlds title of last section. In a crucial passage of the homonymous chapter of Atal and Plateau, there is about I evoke the childhood dream of the wolfman of, of Freud and Faye, remarking how, although the dreamer mentioned to Freud a pack of wolves appearing to him in, in his dreams, Freud could only see one wolf, the, the wolf in general. The wolf is, is a static concept, not as a dynamic becoming. I quote the passage where well, Elizabeth he comments on this peculiar blindness of Freud. The wolfman kept saying there were many wolves, and Freud only, could only see one wolf, one big wolf. I quote, the wolves were, never had a chance to get away and save their pack. <clears throat> it was already decided from the very beginning by Freud that animals could serve only to represent coitus uh, between parents, or conversely, be represented by coitus between parents. Freud obviously knows nothing about the fascination exerted by wolves and the meaning of the silent call, the call to become wolf. Wolves watch, intently watch, the dreaming child. It is so much more reassuring to tell oneself that the dream produced a reversal and that it is really the child who sees dogs or parents in the act of making love. Freud only knows the etypalized wolf or dog, the castrated or castrated the castrated or castrating daddy wolf, the dog in the kennel, the analyst bow wow. End quote. We haven't there, I think, as anthropologists, I am afraid, in that particular situation. They give us a pack of wolves, we can see only one wolf. We already know what we are seeing before seeing it. When a shaman shows you a magic object, a medium gets possessed, a sorcerer laboriously constructs a voodoo doll, we only see one thing, society. Be it belief, power, fetishes, but we already know what's in it, it's society. Uh, as David Kopenawa, the Yodomani shaman, scathingly observed, I quote, you whites, you whites sleep a lot but you dream only of yourselves. And, yeah. Analyzing that remark would, uh, as a tool the force of reverse anthropology, would take me too far, and I can't apply to that. I think it's one of the most brilliant descriptions of, of Western culture that I've ever uh, heard. Uh, but I propose to illustrate that difficulty of our, of our ethno-anthropology, of when given seven wolves, uh, 
respond by seeing only one wolf and already knowing that the wolf is not the wolf, but the father of what have you. With an example for contemporary literature in anthropology, there is no need to go back to the days when Evans Pritchard found it necessary to warn his readers that, I quote, witches as the Azani conceived them cannot exist. End quote. And then, he took as his, obviously, as his responsibility that of explaining why the Azani found necessary to conceive things that cannot exist as they conceive them as existing. <laughs> Difficult thing. But now, consider then, moving from the past to the present, the following passage of an anthropologist I greatly admire, for many reasons, no, no irony intended at all, uh, among, which the sundry, among which I, uh, I uh, sorry, I admire, greatly admire for many, one, many reasons, among which I would name the sundry political feat I feel with both his writings and his concrete extra academic engagements. I am referring to David Graeber, of course. Uh, in a paper of 2005 titled Fetishism and Social Creativity, or Fetishes are Gods in the Process of Construction, published in Social Anthropology, Graeber observes concerning the power of certain beginner idols. I will stress uh, certain words in the, the passage I'm going to quote. Of course, he starts, of course, I'm in major heads, he's explaining the the power of certain arena idols, and then he goes through this passage. Of course, it would, be, it would also be going too far to say that the fetishistic view is simply true. There are lots of model, model idols. Of course, it would be going too far to say that it's simply true. Lungkanka cannot really tie anyone's intestines into knots. Ravaloluna cannot really prevent hail from falling on anyone's crops. As I have remarked elsewhere, ultimately, we are probably just dealing here with the paradox of power. Power being something which exists only if other people think it does. A paradox that I have also argued lies also at the core of magic, which always seems to be surrounded by an aura of fraud, showmanship and chicanery. But one could also argue it's not just the paradox of power, it's also the paradox of creativity. End quote. Well, you see, it was already decided from the beginning to quote uh, in this passage, to quote the reason that I that fetishes could serve only to represent necessary illusions conjured by living in society. You have to believe in that for them to exist. Master Gordon, my colleague at the Mozilla Fanau, in an article from which I stole this passage of Graeber, as well as the general spirit of the commentary, observed that Graeber's, Graeber's effort to save the Marxian notion of fetishism, namely, that fetishes are, I quote Graeber, objects which seem to take on human qualities, which are ultimately really derived from the actors themselves, end quote. And Maso uh, observed that this effort to save the Marxian Marx notion of fetishism somewhat misplaced, a somewhat misplaced effort. He does try somehow to reconcile the Medina to Marx, arguing that fetishism, uh, I mean Graeber, he does try to reconcile the Medina to Marx, arguing that fetishism only, only, only become dangerous when, well, fetishism gives way to theology the absolute assurance that the gods are real, end quote. One might say real as commodities, or probably. Uh, the problem, says Goldman, is that this brave effort to save the native's face is undertaken behind a lot of back, so to speak. Uh, one wonders, firstly, if the conversion of fetishism into, into a variation of the will to believe that is at the root of real social power would be accepted by the natives to begin with. And secondly, one wonders if such a reduction, which sounds more like an essay at reconciling one explicit Western ontology to it, Marxist materialism, with the Marina's implicit ontology, rather than like an effort to problematize our own assumptions, does not end up by more than leaving untouched 
they end up by reinforcing our own ontological framework. One wonders if this is what anthropology should be in the business of doing after all. Let me conclude this example by saying that the so-called ontological term is nothing more than a change in the disciplinary language game, a chain that forbids by declaring it an illegal move, as in chess, within the game, such an analytical facility as that of Gregor's in that quoted part. I have a nagging feeling that much of the uneasiness of or outright rejection of the ontological term rhetorics comes from the restriction of freedom allowed to the analyst that it imposes on the analyst. The freedom to stay put, not to move, to indulge in the heliocentric trick of making the observed turn around the observer ontologically wise. Such restriction is what I meant by the maxim always leave a way out for the people you are describing. This is not a simply, this is not simply an anti-holistic position, nor a refusal of ethnographic, nor simply a refusal of ethnographic omniscience. It is about what I would call the good enough description. A phrase that was actually inspired by the brilliant connection made at the end of the passage by Gregor uh, between the paradox of power and the paradox of creativity. The expression, paradox of creativity, reminded me immediately of the work of Donald Willicott, the psychoanalyst, and his, cru his crucial concept of the transitional space, the area in between pure subjective internal and pure objective external experiences of the infant, from which, from an area from which, says Willicott, all art, all creativity, and all culture, I quote him, spring between the inside and the outside in between the two lies everything. And yet, this area contains, says, says Winnicott, a paradox is built on paradox, a sort of modus band situation where one can't tell the inside from the outside because there is no such thing, in a sense, an inside and an outside. And then Winnicott has a paradox that we should refuse to explain. It's not our business to explain this paradox. Period. This paradox, in a sense, is what makes us human, if I understand Winnicott correctly. Little as it may, Winnicott is also the father of this other wonderful concept of the good enough mother. The mother that is not always there, is not perfect, leaves something incomplete as far as the desires of the infant are concerned, and therefore ends up by raising, unaware, as it were, a normal child. A more than good enough mother would raise a less than normal enough child. I like to think of a good, a good ethnographic description as a good enough description. Don't reduce the paradoxes. That, ter that terrible expression, breaking a butterfly on the wheel, that you all know, kind of thing from Alexander Pope, uh, should be taken in its, in its radical sense in our discipline. Anthropologists are butterfly collectors after all. Leech notwithstanding. We are always dealing with, we are only dealing with butterflies. The legacy is required. And just so I do not finish this, finish this section without making a reference to another of my bombastic admonishments, I'm closing my talk, let me say a few words about the idea of taking seriously the things that people say, people that we study say. Our colleague, Hanne Wiedersle, who is a greatly admired, as I am provoking him here, uh, our colleague, Hanne Wiedersle, had recently published a paper titled Taking Animism Seriously, but Perhaps Not Too Seriously, in which he takes issue with the idea, with the attributes to me, by observing that the idea of taking seriously. He takes issue with this idea by observing that among the Yukagi of Siberia, Ridiculing the spirits, animal spirits, etc., is integral, integral, integral to their game of hunting, and that they know that spirits are an illusion, but they know that ironically go along with it. We should not take indigenous enemies, he concludes, for example, enemies, for example, we should not take indigenous enemies too seriously, he concludes, because the Indians themselves don't. 
I will disregard the irony of having a dour Danish admonishing happy go looking Brazilian not to take seriously whatever there is to take. Okay? But uh, I, I won't take lessons from Hamlet about take, not taking serious too seriously. I hail from Nelson, I hail from Lebanon, for God's sake. <laughs> but uh, uh, I will just repeat, I thought I had explained myself about this in relative nature anyway, that to take serious does not mean to believe. And then, reciprocally, not to take serious does not mean not to believe. Uh, does not mean to be in awe of what the people tell you, to take them literally when they do not mean so, not an easy distinction to make at all to begin with. Uh, or to take it as a profound spiritual dogma or faded law or something like that. It means to learn to take seriously. It means to learn to be able to speak well to the people you study. To employ an expression that you want to To speak about them to them. To speak about them to them in ways that do not, they do not find offensive or ridiculous. That's what it means to take it seriously. To be able to to speak well to them. They do not need to agree with you completely, by no means. All we require is that they found our description a good enough one. Precisely, that's what a good enough description is all about. It will, it will, because the description will always be a caricature of themselves anyway, meaning it will help certain phrases exaggerated, others downplayed, certain points will be overstretched, others will be minimized, and so on in their opinion, of course. Ethnographers are not photographers. They are portrayed as painters. All painting is more or less a caricature, not necessarily in a pejorative sense. As we know, oftentimes a caricature captures the spirit of the person represented much more eloquently than a photograph. And finally, those people who call enemies, for example, among them, would be analogists or naturalists or whatever, but those people who call enemies may choose to take whatever they posit, the animal spirits say, serious, seriously or otherwise. I am sure Contes here is an exceedingly important consideration. Think of disease caused by animal spirits, for example. I don't think they would be making fun of spirits when spirits send them disease, but who knows? I'm not a severalist. But anyway, they may posit whatever they deposit as existing they may take it seriously, seriously or otherwise. But anyway, first, they have had to go through the trouble to create those spirits. One wonders why if it was just to have something to make fun of. Before not taking them too seriously, we should learn not, not to take ourselves too seriously. Because when the chips are down, anthropology is always in the situation of playing croquet with flamingos. So let me talk with another Alice quotation. I'll read it and finish it. I'm quoting now from the same through the looking glass. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away, comfortably enough, under her arm, with its legs hanging down. But generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out, and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up in her face with such a puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing. And, she had, and when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, it was very provoking to find that the hedgehog has, had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, uh, there was generally a reach of, of furrow in the way wherever she wanted to send a hedgehog to. And, as the, as the double up soldiers, the cars, were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. The problem, of course, is that one often has one head hacked off in this game. But that's what we're here for in the first place. Thank you. <laughs>